Remember, let us know your thoughts on the content of this video. Do you agree or disagree? And what solutions are you implementing? First, we discuss the way you, the resident, influence gentrification by territorial stigmatization. Your neighborhoods by glorifying poverty that lures developers and politicians. The second subtle means can be the occurrence of sudden bike lanes in your neighborhood to attract the creative class. The agenda of many politicians today is to transform their inner city to a creative city for this creative class. Unfortunately, this means neglect of the chronic problems plaguing their existing communities. Five examples of government officials favoring creative city policies. Number one, the Asia Pacific. The promise of the creative city is so compelling that there are now more than 60 self-professed creative cities in the world. Across the Asia Pacific, the creative industries began to feature in national and city policy agendas as evident in places such as Singapore, China, South Korea, Australia, Taiwan, Hong Kong, India, and the Philippines. In 2009, the government of Hong Kong established the Hong Kong $300 million Creative Smart Initiative, CSI, to provide financial support to initiatives that are conductive to the development and promotion of creative industries in Hong Kong. In addition, in May 2013, the government topped up the CSI by another $300 million, making up a total of $600 million investment into the Creative Smart Initiatives. Number two, Singapore. Although the government of Singapore believed that material and social welfare, earning a living, and economic survival have always been Singapore's primary concerns, while the arts have never been seen as a basic need, by the year 2000, the government of Singapore wanted to address what it felt was an underdeveloped art culture when it agreed to set aside over $500 million to build a world-class art center. Number three, the state of Michigan. Consider Michigan's Cool City program an economic development strategy that puts creative people first. Governor Granholm, despite having recently enacted the largest spending cuts in state history, was nevertheless able to eke out funds for the Cool Cities program, a central component of the state's strategy for economic and social revitalization. Michigan's greatest economic success has always been tied to the creative and productive power of the city, from the furniture city to the motor city or the cereal city. The mechanism for achieving this feat is a series of $100,000 catalyst grants awarded to cities that have demonstrated some measure of faith by establishing a local cool cities advisory group. These grants are expected to achieve measurable results within one year in neighborhoods that are vibrant, mixed, and happening. Quote unquote. Within a few weeks of the Cool Cities program announcement, some 129 communities across that state had been mobilized for action. And just a few weeks later, 20 had developed full proposals for funding. Most were for mixed-use pedestrian-friendly initiatives, leveraging public and private resources to revalorize historic districts through the constructions of lost bike paths, river walks, and other street-level culture amenities. For example, the city of Songatuck proposed to convert a dilapidated pie factory into an art center. Flint's Uptown Reinvestment Corporation sought assistance in converting a historic bank building into a 16-unit loft development. Turning a parking lot into an ice rink and performance space was a priority project of the city of Marquette. Detroit Jefferson's East Business Association called on the state to subsidize desirable business clients in the technology and entertainment sectors for a mixed-use complex containing 28 lofts, a studio, a TV studio, an ice cream parlor, an upscale bar, an art gallery, and a coffee shop that will double as a music production and education cafe. Grand Rapids proposed streetscaping, 
and art installations around a three to five unit loft complex. Number four, Tampa Bay, Florida. Creative Tampa Bay, which was established in the wake of Richard Florida's visit to the city in the spring of 2003. This will be a decisive force in shaping the economic destiny of Tampa Bay because as cities move increasingly into a knowledge-based economy. However, the consultants hired to probe the hopes and desires of the young and restless reported that Tampa Bay has a long way to go to realize this goal. The spur for action in this case is the yet more sobering fact that Tampa Bay has been on the losing side of the interurban war for talent, the area being ranked almost bottom of 50 metro regions in terms of its attractiveness to the young and restless population of 25 to 34-year-olds. The politics of the creative class stem from their self-image as an unruly tribe of independent consultants. Take me as I am and facilitate the use of my unique skills. Don't expect me to buy into some corporate culture that requires me to change who I am. Number five, Baltimore. The city of Baltimore unveiling its own strategy for the Florida age, rather less than creatively, entitled Creative Baltimore. And Baltimore where civic leaders joked that they should be so lucky to have the problem of gentrification. Mayor O'Malley doing his part by fronting a Celtic rock band in his spare evenings clearly has his work cut out for him. The mayor's plans involve the mandatory bike pass, establishing a mentoring scheme for creatives, extending liquor license hours to 4 a.m., ridding Howard Park of its drug dealers so that it may be safe for dog walkers, creating a street performance program, converting unused industrial buildings to art studios and live workspaces, setting up a citywide musical festival and arts parade, initiating a duck pen bowling tournament in which the mayor's team would take on challengers from the business and cultural communities, welcoming newcomers to the city with a fun networking event, including three minutes FaceTime with the mayor himself, promoting offbeat and eccentric events that are unique to Baltimore, including the American Dime Museum, John Waters and Edgar Allan Poe, and the Night of 100 Elvises. Developing quote-unquote stick-around stipends for creativity inclined college students. However, there is no proof that creative cities boost the economy. Creative economy ignores the intrinsic value of cultural and focus only on the economic gain. The creative class is utopianized to get more assistance from the government, but in reality, the creative class field is insecure. Steve Malanga from the Manhattan Institute pointed out that cities in the United States with the best economic performance based on statistics such as employment and rate of formation of high growth companies were not creative cities such as San Francisco or New York, but places such as Memphis and Las Vegas, which had low tax and policies conducive for businesses. Likewise, Kotkin and Siegel point out that economic growth has been shifting to suburban areas that do not match Florida's idea of trendy liberal cities such as Riverside, California, and Rockland County, New York. Over a decade after his Rise of the Creative Class book, in 2017 this year, Florida has released the Urban Crisis book, citing the same forces that power the growth of the world's superstar cities also generate their vexing challenges. Gentrification, unaffordability, segregation and inequality. Meanwhile, many more cities still stagnate and middle-class neighborhoods everywhere are disappearing. In conclusion, rather what truly matters and serves as a determining factor in attracting people to cities is that people will ultimately go to where their jobs are. Irrespective of the kinds of amenities cities hold, cities should therefore focus on supplying high quality career opportunities rather than becoming a quote-unquote cool city, which means growing the economic base, sharpening skills, connectivity, and access to markets, ensuring local people can access new opportunities and improving key public services. 
Furthermore, the spontaneous and unpredictable nature of creativity means that devising strategies to produce creativity to increase the competitiveness of a city is not practical. Local governments may be able to increase the probability of creative output by creating certain conditions and making investments, but even then the outcome is not guaranteed. In addition, as creativity is relative and situational, not universal or independent, policymakers must be aware that creative city policies have to be tailored to suit local conditions instead of following the standard formula. Next, we discuss zero tolerance policing and gentrification. Stay tuned. Until next time, think independently and strive for intelligence. Your future depends on it.